You see it on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It accompanies all kinds of pictures. These are real pictures when I searched this term from someone's dog wearing a donut costume to the view of somebody hang gliding over a beautiful vista to a family selfie at the beach to a beautifully redesigned kitchen. Something extraordinary is featured and the one who posts it elaborates on what the scene is and then they conclude by typing in hashtag blessed. To be blessed is to be the recipient of some kind of goodwill. It's an expression of gratitude. It's often intended to marvel at the good things in life and to go beyond what the good things in life that go beyond what we imagined they could ever be. There's almost something inherently religious in the term because it takes the focus off of ourselves and directs our gratitude towards at least some kind of ethereal other being out there in the universe. To be blessed is to be grace-centered. I suppose that the opposite of typing hashtag blessed would be to type hashtag I worked really hard and earned this. At the same time, however, this social media phenomenon of writing hashtag blessed has a shadow side too, a shadow side of one-upsmanship. In some way, it's exhibitionist in as much as it's an expression of joy and gratitude. Something drives us to perform our blessedness. And instead of directing our gratitude for our blessings to God, we perform our blessedness for our hundreds of followers online. In the best of hearts, that is an invitation for others to celebrate the good things of our life with us. In the worst, it's really trying to spark envy in somebody else to see what we have that they don't have or don't have as well. Now, some of us who are gathered here, some of you who are gathered online, now may be the time that you can mount your high horse. Say, look, I don't use social media. You don't broadcast your blessings to every acquaintance you know. But this human behavior doesn't require a smartphone. Our online presence certainly amplifies this bragging of our blessings, but humans are always touting those blessings to others. It's the, it's the conversation at the alumni event, talking about the new promotion or the new toy car that you're driving around. It's that Christmas letter that gets sent that talks about how Junior made the All-State Band and how he finished his Eagle Scout project and concludes with, we are just so blessed. So some of us have to dismount our high horse at this point because we know we're guilty of talking about blessings in those kinds of ways. But a few of us still remain, a few who are grateful for the blessings in our lives, who acknowledge that those good things are an act of God's grace and not because of something that we have done, who direct our praise to God and not to others. These are the good Christian folks, humble grateful, truly the hashtag blessed. But maybe not. You see, Jesus, in the opening lines of his most famous sermon, creates quite a different definition of what it means to be hashtag blessed than the definition that we so often see around us. We speak of blessings, and we talk about our comforts. We talk about our endearing relationships. We talk about the trips we've taken, the memories we've made, and the stories that we get to tell over and over and over again. And that understanding of blessing resonates with parts of the Bible, especially parts of the Hebrew Bible. God gives the Israelite people a land. God grants them prosperous harvests, the birth of children, and a long life of blessing as part of God's covenant people. To be wealthy, to have fields full of produce, a full house of children, to be in stable health. These are signs 
that you're close to God, that God favors you. But Jesus, steeped as he is in his own Bible, speaks of blessings quite differently than his tradition often does. That those with the most, that those at the top, those who are happy, those who have the power, those are the ones who are blessed. Instead, Jesus says, those who are downcast, those who are gentle, those in the throes of grief, the ones who work for peace, those who are persecuted for their loyalty to the gospel. These are the ones on whom God's favor lies. In this vision of the kingdom of God, those who are hashtag blessed, they're the ones who stand beside coffins, who sit alone in their depression, who serve in the line to feed the hungry, who advocate for the sick, who speak out for peace instead of promoting their own power. And the great claim of the gospel that we seek to embody as Christians is to live in such a way that these beatitudes become true so that others see this inverse of the popular culture's understanding of what it means to be hashtag blessed. They see that in us. That the secular culture's way leads to emptiness, disappointment, and depression. And so instead, we embody this ethic of Jesus, which results in a life of fulfillment, contentment, and great purpose. So for the next several weeks through the end of August, we're going to be exploring these Beatitudes in their fullness. Here's how it's going to work. Each Sunday, the sermon will feature one of the Beatitudes that we read in our scripture passage for today, and it's going to be accompanied by a story of Jesus or a story Jesus told where he embodies or retells this Beatitude in, in, a, in a way in his own life. For those who want to go deeper, we're going to be accompanying this series with the book, What Jesus Meant, The Beatitudes and a Meaningful Life by Eric Koble. In the This Week at RCPC email that you get in your inbox, there will be the pages to read for the week leading up to the upcoming sermon so that you've had a chance to percolate on this idea before you gather for worship. Our small groups will be using this book as well in our Zoom Bible studies as a way to engage in this uh, study together. The book's fairly short. It's about 10 to 15 pages a week um, of reading if you want to order a copy. I think this is exactly the right moment in our culture and society be to begin thinking about what it means to be hashtag blessed in a gospel way. With COVID-19, we've seen many of the secular ways that we mark our blessings come crashing down around us. We aren't able to do all of the insta-worthy activities that celebrate secular blessedness. We aren't traveling as much, buying as much, renovating as much, eating out, gathering with friends, going to sporting events or concerts. We've seen unrest in our cities, works around racial justice, protests, which has forced us as a nation into some pretty painful self-reflection about how this exhibitionist desire to be hashtag blessed is often carried out in a way that feeds the monster of oppression and racism and classism that flies directly in the face of our Lord who we celebrate and worship each week. Now is exactly the right time to rethink blessing and to relive blessing in a new way. Now's the time, as Eric Koble writes in What Jesus Meant, to imagine a world free of tyranny, poverty, loneliness, and greed that now hold it in thrall. Imagine it loosed of the unholy trinity of ignorance, arrogance, and indifference that conspire to suffocate all remnants of hope. Imagine the hungry fed and the just vindicated 
the poor satisfied and the pure sanctified. Imagine a world governed by the urge for compassion rather than the will to power. Imagine all this, Jesus tells them, because this is what God imagines. Because these are the people God has deemed blessed, and this is what God wants us to make of ourselves. Imagine such a world, and then having imagined it, live in accordance with it. Live it into being. Live as though the world is turned upside down, because when you do, you will see the kingdom. If not come, then at least coming. So I invite you to join us. Join us in these weeks in this exploration, but I also have a challenge for you. I bet you know someone, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, a relative who is fed up right now with life as it is. Even the least introspective person you know <laughs> has been forced in the last three months to do some introspection. Somebody who's fed up with their news feed, who's demoralized by the news we see in the headlines around us. You've heard of their hopelessness and longing, their seeking and their searching. Could you tell somebody, email somebody, send a text about what you're doing with your church at Raleigh Court Presbyterian in these weeks of this summer? Could you invite them to tune in to online worship? Nobody even has to know they're there. They won't be confronted or accosted or asked to join or write a check. Or they could sneak in to worship. Everybody's wearing a mask. Nobody's going to know that you're new anyway. My suspicion is that the success story that we have fostered as a consumer society and as individual people, that that story for many of us is dead now and it's decaying. It doesn't even smell good. And our present national situation has highlighted even more who's blessed and what blessing means. And I still think Jesus has something to offer. I think the church has a way to speak life even into situations of death and decay. I believe we can together redefine what it means to have a life that is hashtag blessed. Amen. Oh,